why circular economy is so important. Uh, one of the one of good friends and uh, one of uh, the real authors of the circular economy, Walter Stachel, nicely summarized it in in one sentence: linear economy is like a river, and circular economy is like a lake. Many years ago, circular economy was already known as a concept, but only lately we have started to, to accept it also in policy making. If I'm frank, uh, many of the solutions which are linked to the circular economy are also possible due to the, due to the uh, uh, quick development in the digitalization area. So all the sharing models, everything, with the fact that everything can be today basically controlled from your from your hands, uh, it makes uh, the things much easier. You will have yours in the afternoon from Ellen MacArthur, uh, who will be, he's, he's an excellent guy also, who will be talking to you about their, their developments and <laughs> their views on the circular economy. Uh, this is just a kind of, a kind of uh, we they call it butterfly presentation of what actually circular economy means. So the principles are on the left. On the right-hand side, the blue part are non-renewable materials. On the left-hand side are renewable materials. Both should be uh, considered uh, in the concept of, of uh, uh, circular economy renewal of economy. And uh, circular economy starts with using less resources maintaining, reusing, redistributing, refurbishing, remanufacturing, and recycling. So many times uh, the attention predominantly goes to the recycling, which is absolutely important and needed. But in a way, recycling is the worst of the good, because when you recycle, the maybe not needed uh, resources were, were already used. And maybe in the first place, we can avoid the use of the additional new resources. So circular economy is about keeping various kinds of natural resources in the production and consumption cycle as long as possible and keeping their value as high as possible because this is creating an economic incentive and I will still talk about that later. So when we approach to the logic of circular economy and I think you, you, the youngsters, will understand that better than our, our generation, is that actually we need to move from the product maximization to providing human needs. So we are currently maximizing profits on the markets through putting as much products on the market as possible. Instead, we would be actually focusing on providing human needs. So we don't need cars, we need mobility, we don't need light bulbs, we need light, we don't need chairs, we need to sit, we don't need refrigerators, we need chilled and healthy food, we don't need CDs, we want to listen to the music, we don't need pesticides, we need healthy plants. So dematerialization, rethinking ownership, moving in the concepts from only efficiency to sufficiency are essential steps which we need to think about and uh, by the way, we are not there yet with policy making, in particular uh, when, when it comes to rethinking ownership and moving from efficiency to sufficiency. For that, one important part is, um, in particular, if you look at through the economic lenses, is how to retain as much value in the, with the products. Uh, here it's one nice example, which is talking about the, the case of the plastics in, in Sweden, official statistics on the plastic waste recycling is saying that Sweden is recycling 53%, which means that one would assume that also the value which they are keeping in the system, it's approximately like that. But if you look to the figures, value of the uh, well, uh, value end of used plastic each year, and then how much of that value you get through energy value incineration, new plastic, and uh, of course, anything which is uh, landfill, it's uh, practically, uh, practically zero. Then uh, value retained is actually 1.3 billion krons, which is 13%. A lot of that value is actually lost through the process of dealing with the plastics. And that is also meaning that private sector has no economic incentive that actually 
uh, steps into that because it's not seeing uh, a really attractive way that they would uh, that they would step into that. Or if you want another nice example, it's connected to agriculture. The most problematic issue in agriculture today is probably the vast use of the of the uh, of the pesticides. So we are still to a large extent using them if let's say 5% of the plants are ill, we throw it across all the field and we repeat that few times until the plants are actually uh, cured. So with the so-called precision farming, so with the drones, robots, um, I don't know, uh, sensoring from, uh, from satellites and so on, uh, a lot can be improved and some are already doing that, but it's quite costly. So small farmers can hardly, uh, hardly afford it. But with that, you can limit the use of the pesticides. But if you look to the incentive which we are sending to producer, since the producer also in the precision farming, it's actually selling pesticides, it is still incentive for a producer to send farmer as much of the pesticides as possible. But imagine if you would go to the real circular economy solution, which would mean that the producer, let's say BASF or Syngenta or anybody else, would not sell to the, consu to the consumer, to the farmer, pesticides, but rather protection of one hectare of the field. So that it would combine their chemical activity with digital activity, which would be of course, very attractive also for small farmers because they will not need to buy any of very, uh, very expensive digital equipment. In that case, the producer Syngenta, BSF and would be incentivized to use as few pesticides as possible. Why? Because in the first case, the amount of pesticides they are selling are their profit. In the second case, the amount they are using for the protection is their cost. So you always have to think in these economic systems how to incentivize producer differently because by incentivizing them to save resources, you have actually done a, a, an important part of the job. Finally, material economics was also looking to the, how one can reduce the, the emissions uh, if uh, for few materials, steel, plastics, aluminum, cement, we would switch from linear to circular economy. And they have found out that uh, in that process, we can cut the emissions for more than half. So uh, not that I would go into details of that, just to mention that the potential which is there, it's enormous. And uh, why I'm mentioning that, because the current climate policies, the current Paris Agreement, it's pretty much focused only on supply side solutions. So on carbon management and energy solutions. So if I a bit of exaggerate, I would say that they believe that if you would create a world in which you would have abundant energy, cheap energy and all renewable energy, you have solved the climate problem. But unfortunately, with that energy, you would just more fuel the human needs uh, on the other hand side. So uh, everything which is connected with uh, uh, food provisions, with mobility provisions, with uh, provisions which are linked to housing and other consumer goods, which means that you need to combine supply side solutions absolutely with the coupling story, which I'm explaining to you and demand side solutions. And if you really want to be effective in the climate context, you need to combine that also with the nature-based solutions. So I firmly believe that only if you use all policy armory in supply side, demand side and nature-based solutions, you can effectively deal with the climate challenge. Uh, you have probably heard about uh, circular economy action plan. Here it's very quick structural overview. I don't intend to go into detail Maybe, may, I don't know, maybe Luca will address it a bit more, but I just want to say that from my times when we were pretty much focusing on the waste, Commission has now moved to the more to the products, which is good. 
because waste it's more end of pipe while products are actually uh, the whole life cycle and uh, i think the next step which will be needed and it's still a bit missing it's a more system change approach which would connect better the things and which would put them into the context of overall economic transformation and that's exactly what we have done and this is also one of the things which i have shared with you uh, to look at and it's connected to uh, the so-called uh, system change compass which was produced by the club of rome and systemic i'm also the member of the club of rome and also the partner of systemic so i'm wearing both of the hats and what was actually the reason that we started with producing that kind of a report the reason was that we were really really happy with the ambition of the european green deal which was clearly setting the targets which was clearly acknowledging the need for fair and just transition and also very strongly talking about interlinked and mutually reinforcing policies which are needed but um, we believe that there are some things which are missing and the implementation is quite uncertain and we simply want to help and uh, i think that was clearly acknowledged also by the fact that van der leyen uh, was uh, was happy to to uh, to provide um, a forward to the report so we think that it's not sufficiently yet address addressing drivers and pressures we think that it does not still offering enough systemic perspective to guide decision making and of course that implementation it's also put at extra risk due to the COVID-19 recovery, which is then uh, leading to the system change uh, to, the, to the compass and to the proposal. I will not go here in detail to, to bother you, but uh, a bit more what the system change compass actually is about. So we have created 10 principles, which we have linked to 30 system level policy orientations, creating a kind of overarching system. Then this, conceptual framework was linked to more real world so to the we called it economic ecosystems and for each of economic systems we have provided also three to five ecosystem policy level orientations and finally we have designed 50 plus investment opportunities which are the redefinitions which we consider as important redefining prosperity redefining natural resource use progress metrics competitiveness, incentives, consumption, finance, governance, and leadership. Each of them in the material which was shared with you, it's explained in detail, in detail and also uh, clearly explained why, why and how it is needed. I will just uh, go as an example to the first one where we talk about policy orientations for each of the compass principle. And the first orientation which we are proposing is that the policy attention should not go entirely as it is today to the wealth creation, but it should better cover also the income and wealth distribution. And uh, that economic transition should contribute to equally to, and, uh, to, uh, to, to equality and to the social fairness, guaranteeing universal basic services and minimum levels of income. Uh, it is also necessary because if we introduce the system which I'm talking about, that might mean that uh, acknowledging the cost of natural resources would have consequences also on, uh, on costs and prices that we need to simultaneously introduce also the things which are linked to the social, uh, to the to management of the social part of the transition, that is needed. That the absorption of the full cost introduced through these economic ecosystems would actually be possible, and we should replace part of income-based taxes with resource-based taxes to address both uh, social as well as resource policy targets. So this is just an example. We didn't want to go into detailed policy making, but just providing the orientations. So 
you have probably heard that some are saying that the world after COVID will not be the same again. Unfortunately, it will be very much the same. We will just hopefully understand it better. Very likely the frequency and severity of health related outbreaks, climate related extreme events will in the future increase, which means that we need to rethink the way we are managing the risks, that we need to collaborate more to build resilient societies and be better prepared. And it means also that the role of science in science in policy making needs to be increased. And finally, that precautionary principle, which is written in new treaties, it's uh, maybe uh, something which we should consider in practice uh, more, and it's not so a bad idea. It can save our jobs if saving the lives, it's sometimes not an argument which it's already good enough. Uh, which is leading me to the reasons why I consider both as two sides of the same coin. Why? I think that the economic policy designed by European Green Deal is already the most convincing competitiveness policy for European Union. According to raw material scoreboard, um, European Union uh, is between 75 and 100% reliant on imports of most vulnerable metals. We are importing more than half of energy needs, net importing. Prices for raw materials are extremely volatile. You can see the latest reports that they are also very quickly growing. And resources constitute the largest share of industry input costs. So Europe is extremely vulnerable when it comes to resources, which means that focusing on that is extremely important. Also, uh, COVID it's, it's, uh, has, has opened some of the questions which are related to the concerns about globalization effect. Uh, you have seen uh, in particular in relation to the global supply chains, but introducing circular economy, it's actually promising to reduce dependence on important imported materials and energy, lower our environmental climate health impacts and create more local jobs. So it's already an important part of the answer. Then when it comes to your generation, through European Green Deal is actually saying that through depletion of natural capital, we have indebted you seriously. And with the billions of financial debt, which we are creating now to answer to economic concerns in uh, COVID combat, uh, a lot of that unfortunately might also fall on your shoulders. So at minimum, what we are obliged is to provide young generation with a safer, more sustainable and resilient world that it's the current one. COVID-19 has provided also the necessary urgency. We have seen if we see something as urgent, we can put human and financial capacities on the table, which also means that we have never really seriously considered yet the climate change, but we have a unique chance with the doubling of the funds for the next uh, uh, period, budgetary period in Europe, that we, uh, that we uh, uh, fix some of the things which were missed in the past. And finally, both COVID-19 and European Green Deal related challenges require a new approach to governance, in particular on the global level. That's the cooperation we talked about. So to conclude, Transition to a more sustainable economy and society is unavoidable. Humans are supposed to be intelligent. It's high time to prove it. So we have to fix a broken compass.